past. Who goes there? Hi, this is Chimes Media and I'm James Williams. Right, Title IX. Title IX is an American thing, uh, but it's been sort of e echoed and repeated around all the, uh, uh, what do you call it, politically correct elites in the different countries which have spread like cancer across the globe. So the, the Australians have got their own versions of PC people. Uh, we certainly have in Britain. It's, it's an awful place. It's, it's turned things around. They've got, you can't make jokes now. You can't say anything out of line. The, even saying there's two genders can get you expelled from school if you're at school and things like that. It's just ridiculous. But Title IX was, I think it, when was it? Back in the two, was it around right about 2009, I think it was. Not sure. But there was this, this is like a um, directive uh, to to uh, it's a, it was an attack on male students basically, and Title IX was was the college campuses. If um, somebody complained that they'd been sexually assaulted, uh, if something like well that means that they were, we'll take it seriously, and the person the the perpetrator, regardless of the evidence, it seems to me almost regards the evidence, uh, would be sanctioned like being thrown out of the college, ruining their. Uh, college career and probably much of the rest of their lives and it's it's been totally unjust because let's face it if you are accused of a sexual assault of rape or whatever you like to call it then surely that's a police matter it's a very serious crime uh, and what was happening was or is that colleges were left to investigate the claim they, they're not sort of legally trained and many of them have got full of uh, lefty professors or feminists who hate men anyway. So it wasn't a very, very just system. And even in some cases, you weren't allowed to defend yourself. It's really outrageous. So it's led to hundreds and hundreds of court cases against colleges for wrongfully uh, terminating students' uh, lives, you know, in the college. I'm not talking about killing them, but st their, their, their career, their college careers. Uh, it's been hugely damaging. And not only that, I mean, quite rightly so, uh, the vitriol against feminists, and I've got no compunction for that because I think they're wicked people, uh, the, the vitriol against feminists has increased. And uh, you, you've got today in the UK, uh, there's very... Uh, uh, what's the... No, no, about 7% of women identify as feminists, 92% do not. Uh, we've now got a situation where... Uh, there's three times as many women that actually hate feminism because they've seen what's happened to their brothers and their fathers and their friends and they actually hate feminism more than say they are feminists and with most men it's much greater than that so yeah but anyway title nine I'm just gonna I'm gonna go th read through this because this is to do with two cases they're not um, gonna give names because they're ongoing cases uh, Right, this is to do with colleges, this is in America of course, Grinnell, Grinnell College and Quinnipiac University, I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, they said barring a settlement, sex discrimination lawsuits against these two colleges appear to be headed to trial after judges in each case denied the school's motion for summary judgment on both sex discrimination and breach of contract claims. These are cases brought by male students who had been wrongly treated, maltreated, in fact. Um, and uh, so they've, they've brought lawsuits against them. And, and, you know, you shouldn't have to do that. I mean, not everyone can afford that, you know. It's, it's bloody awful. It puts a lot of stress on you. Um, anyway, these decisions demonstrate that schools need to take seriously both their obligation to respond to sexual misconduct and their obligation to conduct fair and impartial judicial proceedings. They are also significant because coming at a later stage of litigation, when discovery has already been already taken place, they provide the public with a look under the hood of campus judiciaries in a way that decisions at the earlier motion to dismiss stage cannot. The evidence in both cases reveals a concerning disregard for fundamental fairness and one that both courts felt raised serious questions for a jury about whether these schools breached some of their most basic obligations 
to students. So uh, they're not using real names. So Doe is a general name. It's um, like what you call it, Joe Bloggs, you can call it that. And Joe being a male or female, of course. So they use the term Doe in, Amer in America. So it's not his real name, or it's re his or her real name. So the plaintiff in this case, John Doe, was expelled from Grinnell after two women alleged that he had non-consensual sexual contact with them. Well, that means all sorts of things, doesn't it? And you bump them in the co into the corridor and they would say that. Uh, Doe alleged that in the course of its disciplinary proceedings, the college discriminated against him on the basis of sex in violation of Title IX. He brought his Title IX claim under an erroneous outcome theory, which requires him to demonstrate both that there was articulable doubt as to the accuracy of the college's finding and two, that the gender bias was a motivating factor behind the inaccuracy. A bit like trying to prove your own innocence when you're accused, isn't it? Now, as the court explained, summary judgment is appropriate only when there are no genuine issues of material fact in dispute. If a factual issue capable of sustaining a claim under the governing law may reasonably be resolved in favour of either party, then it goes to trial, unless the parties settle before trial, which often happens. On the Title IX claim, the court first found that there were genuine questions about the accuracy of the proceedings outcome, because the appeals officer, who was supposed to be impartial, consulted during the appeal with the adjudicator who found Doe responsible. The appeals officer even gave the adjudicator the opportunity to respond with any comments to Doe's appeal, which the adjudicator did, addressing each of Doe's appeal arguments and providing additional support for the finding of responsibility, that is. According to the court, a reasonable jury could find that such consultation detracts from the appeals officer's independence and that the lack of an impartial appeals officer casts doubt on the accuracy of the proceedings outcome. Well, I'm a surprise there. And I'd be surprised if they weren't rank and rank feminists. I, I, like I said, I just, I've got no time for feminists. I think they're a despicable group. And, uh, yeah, it's nothing, and it's nothing to do with misogyny. I don't dislike women or hate women. Feminists are a special group. They're an ideological pariah in society. A cancer, I think, as, uh, as some people call it, don't they? And I wouldn't disagree with that. Anyway, moving to the question of gender bias, the court found that the adjudicator may have held a biased perspective regarding the behaviour of women during sexual encounters when deciding one of the complaints which turned on whether Doe had coerced the complainant into sexual activity. In deciding that complaint, the court held, the adjudicator failed to engage with the evidence in the record indicating the complainant chose to engage in sexual activity, even if she was motivated only by a desire to get it over with. So she chose to, it was her choice. So, yeah. I think the the guy's got a reasonable reasonable uh, case there, but there we go. The court also found that Doe raised an issue of material fact by comparing the adjudicator's discussion of his case to an otherwise similar case from 2015 involving two female students. It would be it would be re reasonable although not necessary, for a jury to draw the inference that the language in the 2015 determination differed because the respondent was female. The court also denied summary judgment to Grinnell on Doe's breach of contract claim. The parties did not dispute that Grinnell deviated from its policy and the court found those deviations may have made the disciplinary proceedings unfair to Doe and thus amounted to a material breach of the contract that caused him harm. That's that one. That's the Grinnell one. This is the, and I'm not, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, Doe versus Quinnipiac University. <laughs> uh, anyway, 
Not the same guy. This is a different person now. He knows called Doe. So this case involves a romantic relationship in which both parties, the plaintiff, John Doe, and his ex-girlfriend, Jane Doe, Jane Rowe, right? That's another book. That's not the, That's not a real name. Made allegations of intimate partner violence against each other. Doe was found responsible and punished. Jane Rowe was not. Well, am I surprised about that? Considering in the in the bigger world, the same goes when something like eighty percent of domestic violence is initiated by females, but it's always the guy that gets them gets the bullet. Um, the judge was particularly troubled by the fact that the two Quinnipiac administrators involved in Doe's case destroyed their investigation and hearing notes, which Doe believes contain evidence pointing to gender bias and a motivating factor in the outcome of the proceedings. How outrageous! Destroying evidence! Sounds like the Democrat Party, doesn't it? In the Second Circuit, a party affected by the spoli spoliation, that's a good word, spoliation, that is destruction, they could have said just destruction, couldn't they, uh, of evidence, is entitled to an adverse inference based on the destruction if he or she can show that one, the party who destroyed evidence was under a duty to preserve it, two, the destruction of evidence was done with a culpable state of mind, and three, a reasonable jury might find that the evidence was relevant to the affected party's claim or defence. The court found that all these elements were met, meaning that a jury is entitled to presume that the destroyed evidence likely su supported Doe's claim of gender discrimination. On Doe's Title IX sex discrimination claim, the court held that there were undisputed facts and genuine disputes of material fact that preclude a grant of summary judgment in favour of the university. On plaintiffs' uh, Title IX claims for erroneous outcome and selective enforcement. First, the university may have used a different definition of intimate partner violence when deciding Doe's claims against Jane Roe that it did when it than it did when it deciding Roe's claims against Doe. Second, the court found it was possible that gender bias was behind the university's decision to credit Roe's statement that she was afraid of Doe, but not Doe's statement that he was afraid of Roe. In his breach of contract claim, Doe alleged 29 specific provisions of Quinnipiac's handbook that were allegedly violated in the course of his conduct proceedings. In defence, Quinnipiac pointed to a disclaimer in its handbook stating that it was merely informational and did not constitute a contract. But the court held that this did not preclude a breach of contract claim and denied summary judgment. While there have been hundreds of lawsuits brought in recent years by students alleging they were denied a fair process in campus sexual misconduct hearings, very few have proceeded to the summary judgment stage. Unlike motions to dismiss, which are brought in the earliest stages of litigation, summary judgment motions are filed after discovery has already taken place. In deciding a motion for summary judgment, the court looks not only at the plaintiff's allegations, but also at the evidence in the case. It is quite significant for a court to hold after reviewing the evidence that a university may have engaged in deliberate sex discrimination and breached its contract with a student. For courts to hold that in two separate cases in the span of just two days illustrates the magnitude of the due process crisis on campus right now. Now that's another that's another sort of legacy of Obama in it. All these bloody young people's lives getting screwed up. But, you know, let's point out this much. When you're talking about sex, sex discrimination, it goes both ways. It's not all men on women. It's not all boys on girls. It can be very much the other way around. And seeing how organisations such as colleges 
seemed to gang up against males. You know, it's at that time we had some, some uh, hit back and some justice. And if this is going to cost these cretinous, useless, prejudicial colleges loads of money, then so be it. You know, maximum claims against these bastards because they deserve it. You know, I, 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 it, uh, it's nothing but despair. They, when you get these things, you know, there's, there's no end of people who don't get court cases. Maybe they can't afford it. Suppose you ain't got two pennies to rub together. You come from a poor family or something. How are you going to fight things on your own with no money behind you? Because these things cost fortunes. And there's, so there's many people, many young lads who miss out. And then there's the, the threat. You're gonna, you've got a chance of going to college, but then there is this threat that you could get pulled out at any time because some bloody half-baked feminist decides, oh, I didn't like that, sh that shag with you. No, I'm not, I didn't like that. That must be rape. You know, this is how they, they get this, this entitlement thing goes to their heads as if they have a right to decide a young man's life and what happens. And I'm not saying that they don't do things wrong. Yes, of course. There are uh, young men that do wrong things. It's not all one way either, the other way either. But it seems to be a bit of a heavy leaning in favour of feminists. And that is something nobody should tolerate. Thanks for